Uh, thank you for joining Electric Power Engineers for this webinar discussion. Uh, we are, will discuss today PPEL7, Transition System Plan Performance for Geomagnetic Disturbance. And we hope to share some helpful information with you and welcome questions and discussion. So at any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat. And um, Lori will address those after the um, session. If there's anything that she you know, can't answer in the moment, um, she will follow up with you after. Uh, I also want to let you know that um, we will share this on our website after. So if you or a colleague are interested in it, um, it will be posted to ecconsulting.com and social media in case you'd like to reference it. And I'm pleased to introduce you to Lori Thompson, our Program Manager for NERC Operations and Planning Compliance at EPE. Uh, Lori is an experienced professional specializing in regulatory compliance. She's uh, served as a key contributor for compliance-related activities and assist has assisted with the management and coordination of compliance and training programs. And in her prior experience, she was responsible for ensuring compliance of NERC ONP reliability standards. She is also a certified compliance and ethics professional and is Six Sigma Yellow Belt certified. And she holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. Um, thank you so much, Lori, for um, presenting for us today. And I will pass it off to you. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you to everyone who is attending today um, for joining us for this TPL7 webinar. My name is Lori Thompson, and I'm the program manager here at EPE for NERC Operations and Planning Compliance. Um, Electric Power Engineers is a global engineering um, consulting firm headquartered here in Austin, Texas, um, um, and we have offices in Illinois, Panama, and Lebanon. So thank you guys for joining us. Hopefully um, you will get, gather some good information about TPL7. And if, of course, if you have any questions at the end, um, let me know. Or if you have any questions in between, that's fine as well. Can you guys see it now? Yes. OK, good. Thank you, JC. Sorry about that. Um, so today's agenda will cover what is a geomagnetic disturbance. Um, we'll also go over um, TPL, an overview of TPL7 as well as applicability and effective dates, um, what's currently enforceable, and what is um, the requirements with upcoming enforceable dates. So what is a geomagnetic disturbance, also known as um, a geomagnetic storm or a GMD? Um, a geomagnetic disturbance is a major disturbance of the Earth's mag netosphere, <laughs> that's a mouthful, um, and um, it's coronal mass ejections known as CMEs that eject from the sun that cause a rapid change in the Earth's magnetic field. This change interacts with the Earth's conductivity resulting in ground voltage differences also known or ultimately, ultimately known as GIC flow. Now GIC flow can um, flow through railroad tracks, underground underground pipelines, power grids, and ultimately um, can, can cause blackouts. Um, the GICs can um, cause half-cycle saturation of high-voltage power transformers, um, which, in, which can potentially increase consumption of reactive power and disrupt harmonics. So that's just to give you a little background of what a geomagnetic disturbance is. So NERC developed TPL7 to monitor and prepare for the GMD events. What you see here on this slide is an overview of the standard and how it um, went, you know, what, what occurred, um, what changes took place from version one through version four. So in um, FERC order number 779, the first, um, the first version of the standard is a result of FERC Order 779, requiring entities to assess the impact to their systems from an event known as a uh, benchmark GMD event. Now, this particular version requires um, GMD, required GMD vulnerability assessments, transformer thermal assessments, and corrective action plans. FERC directed NERC to develop um, modifications to the standard in FERC Order Number 8. 30, which became effective 7-1-2019. Now, the second version of the standard added new requirements, R8, R9, and RTN, and required responsible entities to assess potential implications of the supplemental GMD event on their equipment and systems. 
Now the revisions um, in version two um, included modifications to the benchmark GMD event definition, as well as established deadlines for the corrective action plans and um, mitigation plans and required collection of GIC monitoring and magnetometer data collection. So both like well, with the data collection, you know, that provides model data validation and situational awareness and it's um, requiring the reporting of um, and uh, uh, the extensions, I'm sorry, the established deadlines for the corrective action plans help with regional entities with annual updates and things like that. So version three became effective. Um, well, version two, and from version two to version three, <clears throat> you had the Canadian variance, which basically the third version of the standard added a Canadian variance for Canadian registered entities. There were no changes to the continent wide requirements as a result. And then effective 10 one 2020 is the, sta um, the standard version that we have today, which is TPL 7-4. And the current version addresses the directives issued by FERC in order number 851, and that basically uh, modified TPL 7-3. Now, the modifications require the development implement and implementation of corrective action plans to mitigate the assessed supplemental GMD event vulnerabilities and also to replace the corrective action plan time extension provision in requirement 7.4 with a process um, that is which where the extensions are considered on a case by case basis. So our next slide will go over um, just the applicability and the effective dates. So TPL 7 is applicable to PCs. Plan, planning coordinators, transmission planners, transmission owners, and generator owners with um, high side wide grounded terminal voltage 200 kV or above. Um, certain regions require more stringent applicability requirements, so it's important to know the rules and requirements of each region to ensure you, that, you know, and to ensure compliance. Um, TPO has a seven, well, phased in um, standard. TPL has a total of um, TPL 7 has a total of 18 requirements of which 13 are currently effective and I'll go over the next few slides and the five remaining requirements are not yet effective, but they include the but you know, the supplemental and benchmark GMD vulnerability assessment and the develop of uh, the development of a corrective corrective action plans. <clears throat> so the next few slides. Um, I will go over the requirements that are currently subject to enforcement. R1 and R2 are mandatory requirements enforceable as of 10-1-2020. So what is R1? R1 identifies the roles and responsibilities to comply with TPL 7, and um, this requirement sets the standard or flow of how each region will meet its obligation to maintain models, perform studies needed for GMD vulnerability assessments, and implement processes to obtain GMD measurement data. Ultimately, R1 requires the PC to establish a structure to accomplish the requirements of R2 through R13 alongside the TPs. Now, each area's approach to comply with R1 may differ. Um, for, is that, for example, in the ERCOT region, ERCOT has instituted a task force to determine the roles and responsibilities of the entities within the Texas RE region. R2, what is R2? It's where the maintenance of the system models and GIC models are required. Um, system, and system and GIC system models have to be developed and maintained to, in order to perform the studies needed to complete the GMD vulnerability assessments and to ensure stability in the event of a GMD event. So special modeling scenarios based on systems have to be considered. But ultimately, GIC models is the data needed to develop the GIC analysis. Now, depending on the responsible entity as determined in R1, which you'll find in each one of these standards, um, the PC, TP, TO, or GO may be responsible for R2, but most likely it is a collaborative effort with individual responsibilities. So to provide examples of different, different regional standards, um, I conducted a little bit of research where, like for instance, in the New York ISO, the TOs and GOs with applicable transformers have to provide the appropriate modeling data for the GIC models. However, they may be those that with um, that are connected at less than 200 kV may have to submit data as well. 
Whereas in the ERCOT region, they require their registered transmission service providers and resource entities to provide necessary data for the GI system model. So it's important that you read those regional um, rules to make sure that you meet the minimum standard set forth by each of them. Our next slide goes over GIC flow information. Now R5 and R9 are pretty much the same except for the fact that it has a difference with one is for benchmark whereas the other is for supplemental. Now the responsible entity identified in R1 as I said in previously is very is, is very important for all of the standards. Well, that per or that responsible entity has to provide GIC flow to be used in the thermal impact assessment, which we'll go over um, in more detail in the next slide. Um, this information that is provided has to include the max effective GIC flow as well as the GIC time series and is required for both benchmark and supplemental events. I mean, I'm sorry, yes, require, require for both benchmark and supplemental. As noted, you will see here the amperphase thresholds are listed for the benchmark and supplemental um, events and are key for TOs and geos to determine whether a thermal impact assessment is required. Also, the GIC time series has to be provided within 90 calendar days of receiving a written request from the TO or geo. So some evidence to comply with R5 and R9 would vary depending on who is responsible for the GI for providing the GIC flow information. But I I'll definitely, I highly recommend documentation identifying roles and responsibilities as required in R1 is instrumental to demonstrate compliance and, and as, as well as additional evidence, which could include um, the GIC flow information provided to the TO and GO in the planning area um, with the GIC flow um, identifying the max effective GIC value. Um, and correspondence to demonstrate dem um, timely responses to the TOs and GOs should a written request be received. Um, the next slide will just go over R6 and R10. Uh, again, these are two um, requirements that are very sim um, similar in nature. Um, it requires TOs and GOs to complete a benchmark or a supplemental thermal impact assessment. And as I stated before, the amperphase provided in the GIC flow is um, very instrumental because depending on the threshold or whether the TO or GO meets that threshold will, will um, ultimately determine whether or not um, a thermal impact assessment is required. So TOs with a TOs and GOs with a 75 amperphase max effective GIC value provided in the GIC flow must complete the benchmark thermal impact assessment, and those with the 85 amperphase max effective GIC value have to complete one for the supplemental thermal impact assessment. So thermal impact assessments um, they have to document assumptions using the analysis and describe suggested actions and supporting analysis to mitigate mitigate the impact of um, GICs, if any. And they have to be performed and provided to the responsible entities as determined in R1 with a within a 24 calendar month, within 24 calendar months of receiving the GIC flow information. Um, any supporting evidence to document the criteria, criteria was met would be necessary to demonstrate compliance for, this, for R6 and R10. Our next slide covers GMD measurement data, um, which is also currently a became effective on 7-1-2021. Um, this is where each responsible entity, um, as determined in R1, has to implement a process to obtain GIC monitor data, um, as well as obtain, uh, um, implement a process to obtain um, geomagnetic field data. So entities responsible for R12 and R13 13, um, they'll want to have a process in place as well as evidence on how they um, implemented um, or evidence of implementation on how the data was obtained or is obtained. For example, like how often is the data reported? How is the data? How do you get the data? Is there a secure location to access the data? Does one person, is there one significant person or assigned person in the, um, in the, within the entity that can get the access? Um, these are just some ideas on what could be included in that process. 
Additionally, NERC requires annual notification of whether or not an entity collects GIC or magnetometer data. Um, NERC does not require um, installation of GIC monitors or magnetometers, but it, you do have to provide an attestation or, you know, you have to let them know annually. Further details for reporting data is provided in the GMD data reporting instructions located on the NERC website. So our last few slides, I'll go over the remaining five requirements um, with approaching enforceable dates. Um, we have GMD vulnerability assessments and voltage um, steady state voltage criteria, which is covered in R3, R4, and R8. R4 and R8 are very similar as well, except one is for benchmark, one is for supplemental for um, completing the vulnerability assessment. Now, in some regions, um, I'm, you know, with the approaching 1-1-2023 um, enforcement date, um, I'm sure a, a lot of the regions have probably um, either completed or, you know, finishing up their vulnerability assessments. However, I will go over what is required for each requirement. So for steady state voltage requirement, I'm sorry, steady state voltage criteria, the responsible entities identified in R1 have to have a criteria for steady state voltage performance. <clears throat> you'll want to, excuse me, you'll want to see the regional requirements to see what exactly is required for each region um, and who, what role is played in um, setting that criteria. For R4 and R8, each entity, um, as identified in R1, has to complete a benchmark and supplemental GMD vulnerability assessment at least once every five years, and they have to use the studies based on the models completed in R2. Now, those studies have to include system on and off peak load for at least one year within the near term transmission plan and horizon, and also they have to be based off the GMD events described in attachment one. Um, once the GMD vulnerability assessments are completed, it, they should be provided to the RC and adjacent PCs and TPs within 90 days. Now, if, a if an entity um, submits a written request, you have to respond to them or has a reliability um, related need, you have to respond to them within 90 days. Also, if any comments are received. As with the majority of this standard, uh, or this, yet yeah, this standard, depending on the region, um, R3, R4, and R5 may be complete or at minimum in the final stages of completion, as I've said earlier. Um, and final, our, the final um, two requirements are R7 and R11, and that's where um, any G GMD vulnerability assessment resulting in a system performance failing to meet the requirements for the steady state planning events, GMD events, um, are required to um, um, complete uh, corrective action plans. Now, I won't read the slide in verbatim. However, I did want to list out, you know, the requirements, the extent, what what is associated with R7 and R11. Um, but just to name a few, some of the requirements for the collection, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the corrective action plans are um, they that it has to include installation. Um, modification or removal of protective protective systems or remedial action schemes. Um, there has to be, excuse me, specification of non-hardware mitigation within two years of the um, CAP development, um, and then any hardware mitigation within four years of the CAP development. Of course, any documentation of system um, deficiencies and actions to achieve the requirements of system performance is also necessary. Um, if entities require an extension, they have to complete the extension criteria. Um, for example, they have to get approval and provide an updated timetable for implementing those actions. Um, the submittal, um, the caps have to be submitted within 90 days of, develop, of developing or revising, if, within 90 days of development or revision, and that um, those caps have to be provided to the RC adjacent PCs and TPs, as well as any entities referenced in the um, corrective action plan. So should an entity provide a written request or again have a reliability need or comment, a request is required within 90 days. So evidence to demonstrate compliance with R7 and 11 would include of course, the cap um, and any supported evidence to show requirements were met. Um, you also want to include the approval um, 
and documentation and stuff show that the the, it, the extension criteria was was met, such as like timetables, cause of delay, and any um, correspondence to show timely responses. So that brings us um, to the end of our web or the end of my presentation. Um, I hope you found that this presentation was helpful. Um, and at this time, we'll open up um, the, the call for questions. It looks like we have one in reference to slide four. Does version four replace any requirements in version three, or were there just additions and updates? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, version four, um, you said version four, does it replace any requirements? Um, FERC directed NERC to um, submit modifications just to in version four. So there weren't any changes from version three to version four besides the Canadian variance that was um, added. But there were no changes. There were a few modifications though, which was the development and implementation of the supplemental GMD event vulnerabilities and also the replacement of corrective action plan um, extensions um, to be considered on, time, on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. Hopefully that answers the question. Are there any more questions? If you have questions, the, the chat box is open, so feel free to drop them in there. I am not seeing any more questions. Okay, then. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and, and close this out. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we'll we'll make sure to share the recorded session to our website, EPE Consulting. Oh, there is one more that came in. Sorry. If NERC requires completion of a corrective action plan one year after the completion of the GMD vulnerability assessment, must an entity follow the timeline or regional timeline if regions complete the GMDBAs earlier than that enforcement date? Um, I think the question basically is if, if I'm understanding correctly, it's if, um, as I stated previously, if there's more stringent rules from a um, regional perspective versus NERC, I will say NERC rules will always trump um, any regional variants. Um, however, you know, I, I mean, I would recommend following the the rule of the ISO. Yeah, and, and this is JC to piggyback on that. Uh, uh, good job, Lori, to piggyback on that. If it is it, if it is more stringent to follow the uh, ISO rule, um, and it does not, obviously, it's not going to conflict with the uh, NERC standard uh, by following the most conservative uh, requirement. You will by default, and that being the ISO requirement, you will by default be in compliance with the uh, NERC standard uh, in, in theory. Thank you, JC. Thank you. Any more questions? Feel free to ask. Send it through the chat. If not, um, uh, thank you everyone for attending and I'll turn it back over to Jessica. Yeah, thank you for joining us. And like I said, we'll share this to our website and um, to social media. So feel free to follow us on LinkedIn. And if you're interested in the consult, you can always um, schedule that. Um, through our website. Thank you all for joining us and we hope that you'll um, join us for a future webinar. Thanks again. Thanks everyone.